about other gemstones, ones that don't warrant a full section on their own, but they are certainly important and we couldn't leave out of the class. We had previously talked about uh, topaz, all right, as Roman numeral one within this section, and Roman numeral two is going to be chrysoberyl. This is chrysoberyl. This might not even be a gemstone you've heard of before. It's more rare to the consumer, but it can produce spectacular gems. It is not associated with beryl in almost any way at all, except for that when it was first discovered, it was discovered in the same kind of rocks that beryl was in the Ural Mountains of Russia. As we go into chrysoberyl, we should start with mineralogy, and then we'll move on to color and optics. So mineralogy and geologic occurrence. The mineralogy, the chemical composition, again, not something to memorize, but it is a beryllium aluminum, oops, that's supposed to be a two, aluminum two O four. Notice that there is no silica in the crystal structure of chrysoberyl. The important crystallographic aspect, or sorry, mineralogical aspect of chrysoberyl that makes it such a great gemstone that we see over here is its hardness. On Mohs scale, it is an 8.5 of hardness, making it the third hardest of all the gemstones after sapphire and after diamond. This hardness and makes it have a fantastic survivability. And the other thing that makes it is that it lacks a cleavage. So it just does not want to break down in a river alluvial environment, which is going to tie into our geologic occurrence in a bit. Our primary occurrence of chrysoberyl is igneous pegmatites. So let's put that down. Primary occurrence in igneous pegmatites. And like so many gemstones, like topaz and aquamarine, this is the case, igneous pegmatites. But that's not where most of our mining for chrysoberyl is done. Because, because of this hardness and lacking of cleavage, our actual mining is done of alluvial chrysoberyl. Mining of alluvial, sometimes we call those placer deposits, right? They're in the river gravels. Mining of alluvial chrysoberyl, chrysoberyl is where most of it comes from. When we talk about crystal barrel, there is a variety of different colors and qualities. They all tend to be cut from the same, same kind of crystal. And they're, they're called cyclic twins, cyclic twins. We'll put that down here as number four. And this is the crystallography. Crystallography, how does it actually grow? Well, it's twinned with a cyclic twinning, where a single crystal is repeated three times cyclic twinning. So here is, we can do one, here's one crystal, right? And that one crystal is rotated by 120 degrees and then crystal and then rotated by 120 degrees and crystal. So it's a 120 degree cyclic twinning it produces these spokes on a wheel. And if, since you don't have this image, you might want to take a second right here to kind of draw. Oh, you can of course do it better than me but you could draw some spokes on a wheel just to remind yourself what the crystal habit tends to be for chrysoberyl. I'm, I'm loath to leave this picture with the beautiful colors of our different types of chrysoberyl. Let's just label this as from GIA, Gemological Institute of America, to rec recognize our source. Our common chrysoberyl, you know, where we're heading soon is gonna be color and optics. Our common chrysoberyl is this yellow, and then there's a fancy type of chrysoberyl called alexandrite. And alexandrite has a color change. We'll show you some more of that later. Where in incandescent light it is red, and in daylight and in fluorescent light it is green. There's another very expensive type of chrysoberyl called cat's eye. And cat's eye quartz is another type of cat's eye, but that's not the type that has any value at all relative to cat's eye chrysoberyl. Um, our sources where we are mining alluvial gravels for chrysoberyl are twofold. The we're finding, so let's just put like geographic sources. Well, our primary geographic source for quantity is Sri Lanka. And you've heard of Sri Lanka before because so many sapphires are found in those alluvial gravels. Well, same thing is true for crystal barrels. These, this is a gem capital of the world. Now, so in fact, let's put quantity. But it ends up being that the color's not as good from Sri Lanka. The finest 
chrysoberyls in the world. The finest color alexandrites are coming from Brazil. There's a very interesting history there where it was discovered only in 1987. But and then there was this rush towards finding this material. Because it was so, and fighting over mining claims led to people being murdered. The government could not have that kind of lawlessness, and they bulldozed the entire region. Only recently have they allowed new mining to occur there, and it's open again, but only in small quantities. Um, small quantities are being released, but it is the finest material on earth. The initial discovery was in the Ural Mountains, and there's a chance that that opens up again. So let's just put Ural Mountains, and I guess I'm assuming you know where the Ural Mountains are. That's in Russia. And if that opens up again, well, then there could be very fine alexandrite coming from Russia as well. Okay, now for our color and our optics. Oops, close that down. This is going to be B, color, and optics. Well, common chrysoberyl, that doesn't show any phenomenon, common chrysoberyl is yellow to green. Kind of, and the green tends to be kind of a, a, a yellowish green. These are not the most popular for adornment. And so what's one reason why you haven't heard about chrysoberyl? It's not as popular of a color. And the reason why maybe alexandrite is new to you is not because it is not sought after. It's the most coveted, one of the most coveted gems in the world. In fact, we're going to put dollar signs right out here in front of our discussing of alexandrite. Ruby. Emerald Alexandrite are the most expensive color stones out there. And what it shows it has a um, color change from red to green. And we're going to put that red to green color change when it's top grade. And in fact, it has the most vivid color change of any gemstone out there. So no other gem, a lot of other gemstones have color change, but this is the most vivid of all. Most vivid color change of all. Let's put that. We scroll up just to remind you what the colors can be. We've got this red and we've got this green from the exact same stone. That's actually wild, right? But it, of course, we've talked about color change earlier this semester. The reason for this color change is that we have, uh, how can we do that? Well, we'll just write red again. Red is what you see in incandescent light incandescent light and you see green in daylight or fluorescent lights and it's all about the source of the light here because the gemstone itself what it does to show these two color change is that it absorbs yellow and it absorbs yellow exceptionally well and so if your um, source of light has red and yellow in it, like incandescent light does, well, it absorbs all the yellow, allowing you only to see red. And if your source of light has a lot of blues and greens, like daylight and fluorescent, well, and yellows, okay, mixed in, it takes away the yellow, leaving the green left for you. The color change itself, why are we absorbing yellow so much? Well, it has to do with chromium inside the lattice, right? Trace amounts of chromium replacing some of that um, aluminum. We've learned this over the semester that chromium is such an important colorer for gemstones. The next most important kind of color and optics phenomenon is cat's eye. So let's go down here and put a little three and we're going to call this cat's eye. Let's draw, put a really beautiful oval here and we're going to put a, a chatoyant band coming down the middle. You could like kind of make it look a little fuzzy because the light's bouncing off of rutile inclusions or hollow tubes inside the crystal lattice to give us this chatoyancy. So what is cat's eye? Well, in terms of a phenomenon, it's called chatoyancy. That's like the general term for this. And it's produced by inclusions... let's just say produced by inclusions. Most of the inclusions tend to be rutile, and they, when you facet um, a cat's eye, chrysoberyl, in a cabochon, you try to get the rutiles all horizontal like this. 
And when you do, they all those things, they act like thread on a spool or silk, and they reflect this ray or this kind of line of light. So let's call this line of light. And so we'll say like thread on a spool. That's how chatoyancy is produced. The best Alexandrite cat's eye in the world actually has the name of, they give it this name in the industry called milk and honey. And it has to do with the color. So if we were to draw another oval and we put in our chatoyant band and we have our light source coming over here, you know, like a flashlight or a light bulb or just our eyes, right? Here's our source of light. Well, then what we would end up getting is that this side shows a bright yellow of the band, and this side just shows the color of the stone. And again, it's how light is reflecting off of those inclusions. So Chateau and and Cat's is all about this. This is very, very expensive, and it rivals, we'll just put one dollar sign, because it rivals the price of Alexandrite. In terms of our culture and economics, a finishing bit here, well, in fact, here's what we can do. Here's what we can do. Before we go to that, let me, I forgot I had a really nice image of cat's eye here. This is again from GIA. And then I have another image to put in of some fantastic, the highest end jewelry kind of grade of Alexandrite. Here, we're not seeing the specific color change, but we are seeing two different colors within the stone, right? We're seeing that kind of greenish blue and we're seeing this reddish purple and that's because there's a light source here that is allowing our eye to see these two things but this is from that omi Privé jewelry source and i bet each of these rings are on the order of i don't know the price but they're going to be between 20 to forty thousand. would be my bet that's how expensive alex and right can be so in terms of our culture and economics let's finish here oh we should finish with those at least on the screen right so we can appreciate them as we get bored culture and economics in terms of our economics well supply is very low and demand is very high that makes the prices incredibly high even really low-grade Alexandrite is $1,000 a carat. There have been synthetics produced, but they are fairly easy to identify, I suppose. I don't, you don't hear about synthetics crippling the market. And in terms of our culture, the rich can afford it, and that's unfortunate for those of you born in June because it is the birthstone of June.